Hi everyone. Um, I would like to thank Rachel, Hannah, Mirna uh, for the invitation. Um, I would also like to thank you, thank um, Sebastian, Eve, and others in the technical team for the support. Um, I want to also thank um, the speakers before me who have um, all of them mentioned Palestine, the gen ongoing genocide in Palestinian lands, and other violences uh, ongoing at the moment uh, in other parts of the world. Um, I would like to acknowledge also that we are bearing witness. And I would like to invite you, I know some of you live here and some of you maybe visit for the um, festival temporarily. If you're here uh, for a couple of days, uh, feel invited to a reading vigil that takes place on Dam Square, 12.30 to 1.30 every day, one hour long. We read um, um, books from Palestine, um, books about Palestine, uh, novels, poetry, children books, uh, political analysis, etc. Um, come and read with us. There's always a Palestinian flag and a group of people come together and uh, we yeah, take turns in reading and we record these readings. Radio Alhara um, uh, streams them uh, afterwards, not at the moment. Uh, so please feel invited every day at 12.30 on Dam Square. Uh, it's called Reading Vigil for um, Free Palestine. Um, I would like to start with a um, somatic exercise. Uh, I would like to ask you all to stand up. If that is accessible to you. Um, and if you don't have enough space, maybe if there is possibility to make some space in between the chairs. Um, I would like to ask you to close your eyes with me. And we take uh, three deep breaths together. We align our breaths to each other. We take a deep, long breath in. And we breathe out. Another breath in. And out. The third and the last breath in. And out. You can slowly open your eyes and find the partner in the crowd and turn towards each other. And look into each other's eyes. Um, and we do take three breaths again together, aligning our breaths to each other. We take uh, a deep, long breath in and out. Another breath in and out. The third and last breath in together and out. The next part involves touch. If you have something specific, if you don't want to be touched, please communicate this to your partner. Um, or if you want to be touched in a specific way, also communicate, specific, specific place, also communicate. <laughs> yes, well, I, that's not for sure they're gonna do that, but communicate. <laughs> uh, so you're facing each other. One of you turns around. One of you. One of you. So you're facing each other. One of you turns around. The other is facing the back of the one who turned around. 
The one on the back rubs their hands and makes it warm. And once your hands are warm, you touch the spine of your partner and hold your hands there for 10 seconds. You can take your hands off. And so the one who's tur who turned around turns back. And then the, w the other one turns around. So we're switching. We do the same. And touch the spine of your partner and hold. Yeah. Now the one who turned around can turn back. You can thank each other and take your seats. <laughs> thank you so much for participating. <laughs>
feel like a guest to these images and invite yourself, the inhuman, non-human, and beyond human, in order to connect. Here we go. Between 1977 and 1979, in Fechel, a small town between Eindhoven and uh, Den Bosch, in North Brabant region of the Netherlands, which is the south of the country, a group of 65 women, uh, women workers from Turkey, had a labor dispute with a vegetable processing company they were working for at the time, called Hebruders Pluchmakers. The company was run by three brothers, Pete, Jan, and Nico Pluchmakers. This is a video from Belden Cloud Archive, um, which is Sound and Vision Archive, from one of the news items. This dispute was happening in parallel to another labor dispute by labor migrants from Turkey in Almelo, north of the country, uh, in a chicken factory called Tendam, northwest, uh, northeast. Sorry, this project extends its research into female solidarities among these parallel labor disputes, especially into how these women influenced and inspired each other in two locations across the country. In this presentation, I will uh, solely focus on Fechel. This is, uh, this is a book by Bertin van Manne, a Dutch photographer, and she's the only person who followed both strikes and took photographs of both strikes, and they're in this book. Um, I've conducted research in the archives of Beeld and Cloud, the audiovisual archive, sound and vision archive, EESG, International Institute of Social History, which includes labor migrant organizations archives, and also FNV labor union archives, uh, and several other national archives. Um, also in newspaper archives, I conducted research, several regional, local, and personal archives, and I could find traces of this dispute in these uh, different places. Um, like many archived histories that are not researched but solely brought together, um, these documents are out of context. They are compiled together with other unrelated materials and often fragmented to an extent that they are unrecognizable. So you need to bring the pieces together. Uh, many videos I found are newsworthy, coming from broadcasting agencies. And um, if you think about newsworthy material from 70s and also from now, uh, in the intersection of labor and migration histories, this could become qu quite troublesome because it's either individuals' success stories of uh, uh, migrant, lab uh, labor migrants or uh, stories that they are criminalized. Um, I had to contextualize what I have found and my aim was to inform myself of the history of labor migration in this country. And I was interested in tracing my own lineage. And I'm think I was thinking about, and I'm still thinking about, what does it mean? Um, how can we think about non-biological, non-genetic ancestry? Um, how can I think about non-biological, non-genetic ancestry uh, as an immigrant uh, from Turkey living in this country? So. Contextualization started with ordering the archived materials, lining them up, what happened when, uh, in a chronological order. It started on the, on the wall uh, of my studio, and then it became a digital uh, timeline. And there were several timelines. One is Fechel, one is Almelo, another one is what social political um, events happened in, the, in Turkey between 1960 and 1980 that would affect this migration and what are uh, social political events that happened in the Netherlands that would affect, uh, um, affect this migration um, and policies that have passed, and etc. Um, linear timelines serve a certain understanding of an investigation a researcher is supposed to do entering institutional archives, letting their body and also their research be formed by these spaces. My efforts to document and materialize these histories did not necessarily correspond to how their subjects were remembering or reimagining them. And I'll talk about this later. Um, I would like to go through uh, some of the headlines and materials I found. 
1977, in, in after a police raid, Pluchmarkers, the company, was forced to sign a CAO, Collective Labour Agreement. Um, in January 1978, and the dates might not match what I'm saying because these are the sources that refer to a Janu January event. FNV, the labor union, got involved with the case and demanded the collective labor agreement uh, for the workers. And these are the first migrant women who unionized in the Netherlands, um, which is quite historical in the, in the country. Um, 28 September 78, Pluchmakers did not sign a CAO, and FNV, the labor union, sent letters to main buyers. Um, um, of Pluchmacher's onions, because these women were peeling onions in the company. And the labor union described the working conditions and asked the companies um, not to work with Pluchmacher's. October 78, Pluchmacher's demanded FNV, the labor union, to rectify the letters, later sued, sued the labor union in, in the grounds of defamation. October 78, Pluchmacher's made uh, workers sign a work permit through which they decreased the workday from five days to three, which meant they could not earn enough uh, wages and they, did, they could not read the agreement because uh, it was in Dutch. Uh, October 4, 1978, Pluchmakers tried to bribe one of the women to write a letter on how good the working conditions are in the factory in exchange for holiday money. She refused. And she talks about it in a television interview. October 17, 1978, a television program interviewed multiple employees of Pluchmarkers. Um, the women were not named in any of the newspapers, newspaper articles. In the interviews they gave to television programs, they were named as women workers, Turkish women, Turkish peelers, onion peelers, etc. They became anonymous figures in newspaper articles talking heads in television programs and not seen as subjects of this labor dispute and never referred to um, with their own names. 38 liraya yömiyesi. 38 liraya yömiyesi. Sorry. 38 October 19, uh, 1978, exploitation of Turkish employees uh, in Pluchmarkers, at Pluchmarkers Erde discussed in Tveide Kamer, which is House of Representatives. The court case started in October 26, 1978, and uh, second and third of November, second day of the court case, Pluchmarkers loses the lawsuit. And then second December 1978, Leila, Leila Ileri Razaki gives an interview at the television program Ombudsman about the working condition of the woman. Leila was the only woman who was referred to by her name in the television and newspaper items about the dispute. She was not a factory worker. Um, I'll talk about her in a bit. She's also here at the moment. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Leila. Uh, FNV archives of this period is under reorganization, so it's not possible to find a dispute in these archives, hopefully um, soon. Uh, in this photograph, um, the photographer unknown, um, because the photographers are not uh, uh, credited at that time, um, taken on 2nd November 1978 in front of the courthouse Utrecht, where they had the court case. And uh, you can see the workers framed by two men, one on the right, your right as well, uh, Case Schelling, the head of FNW at the time, and one on the left, uh, one of the workers from uh, Stichting Wasein Bautenlandse Werknemers, who are, it's an organization actively working on improvement of work conditions and lives of labor migrants in the Netherlands. Um, these women protested in front of the courthouse in Utrecht. They filled the courtroom. They organized and gathered insistently, and always as a group. And this photograph is from one of the gatherings to celebrate the court victory. It is also from Bertin van Mana archive. Um, several other photographs. Um, the, the photographers are not credited. Um, so when and how does something disappear, something or someone disappear? When its context, its multidimensionality, relationality is taken away, 
When it moves from one place it belongs to, to another place it does not. When it migrates without its relations. In that sense, disappearance in an archive par parallels disappearance through migration of a document from its own context to the context of the archive, or of someone from their own context to another. When one migrates, when all the references, all the connections and relations are left behind that person, that person can temporarily disappear until a new context and relations are built, until one can make sense of their existence in the new context. In the context of migration histories in the archives, we can talk about a double erasure, well, multiple erasures. Both migrating and experiencing an erasure of context and relationality, and once again being erased through being decontextualized in the archives. An instance that reminds us of the slogan, not without us, about us. These materials are decontextualized as they're not with their own relations, people and subjects. The double erasure here also refers to the inhuman, inhuman condi working conditions, and once those conditions are inhuman, the representation parallels that. Contextualization could be a form of repair, it could be a form of care, it could be a way of reorganizing, recreating the relationships that are lost. It can simultaneously underline and contemplate, contemplate on the loss itself. I'm thinking of this in reference to Sadia Hartman's methodology, Critical fabula Fabulation. She's not interested in yet another fiction, but a recontemplation in the light of what is and is not there. The context she works with is entirely a different one, from a different time frame, Atlantic slave trade and 400 years of slavery. What methods would make sense to contextualize the labor migration experiences in the 1970s in the Netherlands? In the end, erasure of context and relationalities is a primary colonial move. Incisive, rigorous research is demanded in order to address, about, address this erasure, and whose labor does this need to be, and whose labor does it become? December 6 to 7, 1978, the case continues. Ploof markers still did not sign the CAO. They want to replace the women uh, workers with machines, and the Ministry of Internal Affairs is involved. FNW files an official complaint to the ministry. 1st of February, 1979, Ploof markers signs the CAO agreement for all the workers. 1982, Plufmarkers goes bankrupt. Um, at this moment, there is a company uh, called Plufmarkers in Frechel in the same location. They reopen with the same name. Kamila Kahraman's daughter, Shener, distinctly remembered the meeting location in this photo. This is from Bertin van Manen archive. With its low ceiling, the gathered crowd of people she mostly knew and especially running around with other kids in the large hallways, and how these meetings became an adventurous social moment for her as a kid. Later on, we realized that this is a photo from the strike in Almelo and not in Fechel. This photo is also from Bertin van Manen archive in Atria. She kindly accepted me to use this uh, for the project. Archival research becomes an excavation with a desire to construct a coherent narrative while being confronted by the subjects of the archived materials, voicing and remembering a different reality or imagination. The archived documents are ordered to act as proof of coherency. The subjects of the dispute remember the sunlight in those days, how one moved and talked, how things smelled a certain way, who made the funniest jokes, how one woman turned around, looked at the rest, what exact words she used, what the weather felt like in their, on their skin, how the others were dressed, how one's hair fell on one's eyes, the reddish glimpse in the of the light in the sky and the roughness of the fabric on the seats. Contrary to the romantic atmosphere these details seem to convey, the woman, also, the woman I talked to also tenderly and directly gossiped about each other and their earlier versions. Uh, more than they remembered the archived facts or matched the images of, to their memories. They are the subjects that are misremembering, de-remembering, unremembering, and this way misfitting into the institutional bodies that imagine, contain, and capture these histories. Imaginations of history and the present and the projected futures are seemingly occupied by the archival. 
In this nonlinear continuity, the urgency of the imagination and the embodied surfaces as the basis of thought and action. How could we imagine remembering otherwise, through which we can imagine other futures? Although none of the women workers were named in the archives, there was one woman, Leila Razaki Ileri, who was working as an organizing in a stichting, um, um, the same stichting as the worker I mentioned earlier. She's the person who first got in touch with FNME, the labor union, um, also who got in touch with the workers and listened to their complaints and brought them in contact with the labor union. And she at times worked as a translator between the union and the women workers, and she's currently working as a translator as well. Uh, she was named in this news clip from TV program The Ombudsman, and um, it's worth noting that Leila's name was on the screen because she was a translator and organizer and not a factory worker. The class and classification was distinctly visible through the image regimes. We vroegen het aan mevrouw Illerie van de Stichting Buitenlandse Werknemers in Vechtel. Mevrouw Illerie is zelf Turkse. Ze spreken Turkse vrouwen van ploegmakers dagelijks. De klachten zijn bijna niet veranderd. Uh, ze zijn uh, hetzelfde gebleven als uh, in het verleden. Uh, ploegmakers uh, zegt dat, wat, uh, de vrouw, dat de klachten van de Turkse vrouwen allemaal leugens zijn. Maar ik weet uit uh, contacten... Uh, met de Turkse vrouwen die daar werkzaam zijn, dat alles wat ze zeggen en, uh, op, op uh, waarheid berust. En daar sta ik 100% achter. Um, Leila um, talks about every day meeting the workers and how she is behind the, the words that workers say and their claims. Um, Together with Leila, we went to Utrecht, to the courthouse where the um, um, court case took place. And you can see the, the fence on the background um, and the pavement um, that follows and, and shows the courtyard. Um, there's a continuity. She tried to con reconstruct the image of the protest during the trial days in 2nd November 1978. Leila could not remember what happened in the court that day. Then she remembered the wind and how the weather felt on her skin. Insisting in using what is found in the institutional archives as the basis misleads the memories. Once again treats the archived material as proof of new coherent linear narratives. At some point I realized Leila was trying to match her memories to the archives, fulfilling the demands of the research and the researcher. What are the expectations from a subject in an archived event as the archive ultimately becomes a fiction of the archiving institutions and the researcher? Leaving the factual behind creates space for the embodied and essential. Together with Leila, we went to Fechel after Utrecht. Although before moving to Amsterdam, Leila lived in Fechel for some years. She could not remember the streets. Everything has changed. We then found Kamile Kahraman, who is uh, in the middle, um, and her daughter is on the left. Um, Kamile Kahraman was Leila's neighbor at the time, one of the workers at Pluchmakers, and one of the women who spoke in the TV program I watched a million times. Kamile's daughter, Shenaj, on the left, was a little kid then. Kamile did not remember the court case, but together with Shenaj, they spotted one woman in the crowd, uh, in the photograph in front of the courthouse, who looked like Kamile, they thought. They could not be sure if that was Kamile or not. With the term right to opacity, the French philosopher and critic Edouard Glissant claims that transparency and translatability may result in reducing, normalizing, and assimilation of cultural differences and ignore their complexity, unintelligibility, impenetrability, and confusion. Instead, Glissant refers to a delirious speech in which he includes whispering as a way of healing the scarred, exhausted, and punctured souls, and as a survival technique. 
The embodied emerges in this research as multisensory modes such as listening, hugging, pointing at the screen, la laughing together, touching, gossiping, whispering. The memories that survived are embodied and sensory, not abiding by an ocular or language-centrist approach, and instead bringing to the fore a non-linear approach to filmmaking, storytelling and remembering. In this way, the body and the experiences of the body are centered. Could the nonverbal sounds and the sounds of gossiping crowd would be a, a way to survive. Creating spaces to thrive in times of survival is exactly where the gossip emerges. What Leila, Kamila and Chanel remember and talk about are not the facts, but the bodily experiences, feelings of camaraderie, memories of care, cooking for each other. While thinking beyond the human, the body urgently becomes a base with its potential to record and carry experiences, the inarticulate, intangible, unexplainable and untranslatable ones. Its manifestations can be read not through a solid vocabulary, but through relationalities through its own constantly redefined collective or individual language. The body, and here I'm thinking about it beyond the human body, is interdisciplinary, and its language belongs to no one and everyone. The body its own, is its own archive, and tapping into this archive is the way to connect beyond, beyond the human. I will show a clip. If we could uh, turn off the lights. Ben bu bu bu şeyi hatırlıyorum anne. Kendi de çok çalışsın. Kendi de çok konuşuyorsun. Aynen. Hale diktatör karıydı. Öyle mi? Ya ya ya. Aynen. Ya sabah altıda gidelim. Akşam çok pardon. Sabah değil mi kendine? Sen ilk defa görüyorsun değil mi? Ha? İlk defa görüyorsun. Evet evet evet. İşte burada televizyona çıkmıştın sen. Hı hı hı hı. Thinking about care and future imaginations, researcher and writer Maria Puy de la Bella Casa, in a chapter titled Touching Visions in their book Matters of Care, proposes hepticality against the primacy of detached vision and the haptic's inevitable reciprocity, how it blurs the boundaries between the self and the other. Hepticality for Puy de la Bella Casa 
is a neglected mode of relating and it has the potential to shake the primacy and privilege of vision in critical engagement and knowledge production. She adds, to touch is to be touched. If we consider that troubling oneself, or rather the self, is at the root of caring, I would propose that troubling oneself aligns with the somatic practice that we started with. Somatic practice, I propose, is the first step tro towards troubling of oneself. And I would like to end with another one. If you could all stand up. Uh -oh. um, we again close our eyes and we take three deep breaths together. We breathe in and out. Another breath in. And out. Another one, the last one in. And out. Keep your eyes closed and we move to the second exercise, the last exercise. Imagine a soil or earth colored light surrounding your body. If you want, you can add some sparkles or glitter in it. Feel the edges of your body covered by this light. It's all around you. It's protecting you. It's creating stable base, a stable base for you to move from. It's making it possible for you to take action with that stability within you. Your eyes closed, start imagining the light starting from your head and moving along all the way through your body. Feel the edges of your body. Going to your shoulders, to your hands, your belly, your back, your thighs, your knees, slowly down. If there are empty spots, stay there and fill them. With this earth-colored light, make sure it covers all your body. We go down to your toes, back of your feet, under your feet. Once you feel it all over, all around you, take another deep breath. In and out. You can open your eyes. Thank you so much. I think it just does itself. Yeah. Oh, so, I, yeah. I so, but I think I've lavered it, so you're good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I was a little dubious at first when you told me before the talk that you were going to do a somatic exercise. Um, and especially after the first one, thinking about this uh, more recent body of work of yours, a lot of your previous work is, uh, is quite... Uh, quite focusedly, quite intensely critical of, uh, you know, of, of Turkish regimes and of, sur of surveillance and many things. And, but this current, this current body of work, which is, 
not necessarily uh, touch-based or feely in, the, in, in some way, and it is uh, physically displaced also in some way. Uh, I realized over this presentation that like formally, despite that you're making, that you're constantly, that you're going back and forth, going back to make work in Turkey, going back to make work here, uh, focusing on these difficult but more kind of day-to-day -day stories of, you know, of, of labor and immigration and sort of just the uh, womanhood and just the sort of, you know, the various toughnesses of being whether an immigrant or one who stays. Um, I was thinking about the way that you made these really simple and often kind of uh, physical-based connections uh, between between these two uh, between these two groups. And um, I don't know, maybe you could talk about the, the beginning of that kind of form and um, if that makes sense as a question. Between these two groups? Well, between um, the people you work with uh, in, in Turkey and the people that you work with here. here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, my work has been uh, very much um, geographically based in Turkey. Um, and there was a... Um, a work of mine was censored in 2016 in Turkey, and then there was a period that my relationship to Turkey has been kind of disrupted uh, by that uh, censorship. Um, and then from then on, um, I started working. My work is more based here, but there are a lot of connections. And when I go back, I'm also searching for labor migrants who have moved back to uh, like went and then returned. Uh, yeah, came here and then uh, went back. Um, also, some of them I hear that uh, when we went to Fechel, when we were asking people around, uh, some of them died, but some of them also moved out, moved back to Turkey. So there's all these connections, and I'm moving away from that geography, but not really at the same time. So um, then I'm, I think I'm more thinking about and talking about the displacement and what that does. And it comes from a personal place, inevitably, uh, I would say. So, um, um, and my work has been about archives before as well. Um, I am part of a group who formed BAKMA, B-A-K.M-A. Um, it's a social movement archive, uh, online, digital, um, um, mainly based uh, on moving images and video activist work. Um, it started with Gezi Uprising, and then, because my background is video activism, and it was like kind of the next step of like, how can we think about archiving and history of video activism, and what we have done so far, um, so that it communicates and it reaches out, because it also maps um, um, a certain period, uh, um, social political history of Turkey, um, and also it connected us to different groups and initiatives as well um, that existed, but we didn't know or they didn't know us. So um, it is connected, but yeah, groups are not necessarily connected to each other. But these geographies, I feel like I'm kind of viewing them to each other. Um, in these works, yeah. Um, maybe you know, more personally, how do you deal with a sense of an idea of, of, of home or being in a place here versus there or between or mm. nowhere? Mm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let me get some water. <laughs> how do I think about home? Um, yeah, I was I was not going to Turkey for a bit, and it's uh, it's uh, it's an interesting. Yeah, it's it's something that you miss. I miss deeply, and the moment I went back, I, I realized how um, the easiness of connections and how you know you kind of something is posed but not really posed. It just can restart from where it has been left or never left. Maybe even the feeling. Um, yeah. I uh, I live here for a long time, but I, it's difficult to call it a home. I would say it's a, and I don't think it's a personal experience. It's a really a shared. It's a personal experience, but it's a shared experience as well. That's something that I keep having conversations about with people who live here for a long time or um, or different periods of time. Um, and then in relation to the work, um, I think the. Um, 
yeah, the concept of home, the feeling of home and what they call home has always been um, um, Turkey, definitely. That's uh, distinctly so, I would say. Um, and then also... If it's even a value for you anyway. You know. Yeah. And also it's like interestingly that people always form these local networks. Um, uh, the women that I talk to, they always form these local networks of co uh, connection, care and, and solidarity with each other. And then I'm interested in these two labor disputes because they happened at the same time. And I cannot find traces of how they communicated, how they... Um, yeah, supported each other. So that's uh, something I'm interested in as well. Um, being not so far from each other in different parts of the country. Yeah, and that's part of a reparation of the archive, possibly. Yeah. yeah. Um, before I open it up, I wanted to ask you one more question around your conceiving of the archive. Um, you emphasized an idea of non-linear, like along with uh, disappearance and uh, attempted traces, an idea of a uh, a non-linear archive as a, a, a as, as a methodology for um, for maintaining in different mm -hmm. ways, and I wanted to know if you could maybe speak more about why that concept. Yeah, I mean, uh, because of like making these um, timelines, and I think the linearity could be a point of reference, but then it needs to be the the research needs to move away from it. And when I think about contextualization, it doesn't necessarily mean a chronological timeline that would contextualize the, what has happened, but contextualization could happen through, um, um, through the video that I showed uh, last. So how can we rethink contextualization in a different sense that it does not only talk about like what happened when and the facts and, um, and then, um, yeah, kind of valuing that more than the the experiences and remembrances, memories of the of the people who have been subjects of these histories. Yeah. The making of these works is not just uh, a witness, but it's actually a catalyst for other memories to come or in these conversations uh, yeah. to, to return yeah, and continue. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, uh, some questions from you. In the back. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks a lot for this uh, moving talk. I had a question. So as far as I understand, is your criticism of the archive is that it doesn't capture these, um, yeah, these meta kind of data in terms of how people interacted and how people felt and you captured, try to capture this by your interaction with these women and how they remembered uh, mm -hmm. things. But um, we also know that memories are not infallible, right? And as, as, as we saw in this last clip, they were, there was laughter, they were very positive about their, this, this situation, where, whereas it was, very, it was a hev very heavy moment also in their lives. And I can imagine that memories, if we look back onto something, we generally tend to look at, at it in a positive way and, try, and tend to forget, brush over the negatives. How do you trust memories in your uh, concept then? Um, I think um, maybe if you go back to the critique of the archive, um, for me it's not that the archive needs to include these, but what I find in the archive becomes quite violent because of how decontextualized it is and and these histories are really um, um, not contextualized in any way. And it could be different ways. It does not have to be the way that I propose. This is one of the ways that I propose, but not the way or only way, right? So it's a critique of the archive. And another aspect, and the reason I started with the somatic is that um, I will add to, add to your question the reason I started with somatic is that there is a critique of the archive, and when you do the archival research, there's always a critique of the archival institute. And it is included, and it's there for, uh, yeah, for a really long time. But then there is another aspect, there is another criticism that needs to come towards the researcher who enters that institution. Um, and also being exposed to images of others and stories of others. Um, which we can talk about it in a larger sense, not only in the archive context, but also um, how do we 
how do we get exposed and how do we make sense and how do we engage with images of others. So that's why I also started with the um, somatic. So I don't want to like kind of limit what I um, presented to an archival critique, but it's more like what does not fit into these institutional archives. They are not archivable and what, what does not fit makes a lot of sense and how can we look into and listen to and, and um, uh, really like kind of uh, find different modes of looking into what, what kind of knowledges are produced there, what kind of experiences are there. Um, so it, it's not that why does not, why the archive does not have it and they should have it, the institutional archive, not any archive, but also um, uh, it's about like as an artist to approach it uh, and to pro propose a different entry point to memories. And I don't have to trust the memories. That's also exactly the problem, right? Like we need to trust that it gives exactly the right information, but it's about um, how can we make, think about the memories as a legitimate, legitimate source. Legitimate source. From what? From the Ah, okay. So it's not about like, it's not about how can you, like, I, I think there is something to be troubled in that question, how can we trust the memory? Because then like we're trying to again go for a coherent narrative, right? Like what happened in that period, in that moment, um, and how you remember it, they, be, they are part of that moment as well. Um, I think it's important to trouble that question um, at the same time, because that, that goes to a linear logic again, right? Or like a reason and, and a different way of like reasoning, um, which does not fit into what I'm proposing, really. Yeah. Yeah. So if I were, for example, a researcher, a historian that was interested in labor, right, and feminism and stuff, uh, sorry, not uh, yeah, not stuff, but uh, in, in that period. <laughs> what? Um, <I'm> sorry. <laughs> um, wouldn't it confuse the research and to pinpoint down exactly where the labor right um, movement started and what provoked it? And like, we we need to be correct about certain things, right? We cannot. I mean, it's nice to include these these uh, uh, a little bit more intangible things, but we they, they were labor right violations that we need to be correct about. Yeah, I think, I, think the, I think I showed the articles and all the information that is about, I mean, I'm not trying to defend, but it was there, right? So what I'm interested in is how can we go beyond this? It's not that the labor disputes are not there, it is there, and I'm not saying, you know, or, I'm saying this, and. So can we hold those together, is my question maybe. And I just say the obvious, what is in the archive is, is ultimately is political or more is what's not, right? So, uh, and, and whether you can call those facts or not, I'm not sure. Um, if you'll indulge me in one last quote before we get to our last question, um, because, because Imani brought up the... Uh, if I, if I add to that, also a lot of the materials I found in the archive were... Um, wrong or they did not make sense, they were tagged wrong, they were, you know, um, connected to different materials that did not make sense. So th there was a lot of um, troubling information. Um, and I, I mean, I have an experience working in an archive in Germany and using materials that were given to me and finished, making a finished work and realizing those materials were not given correctly and that you know like these kind of like this trust towards the archival institution the inst institutional archives is really also something that we need to really uh, question at the same time like what is what is this truth that we're going after and then someone gives you this yeah this is the story and but that that's oftentimes not the story um i guess there's always yeah there's always gaps so that they're always over narrative or yeah yeah, yeah. So, projections yeah, yeah. Um, since Imani brought up the Haitian Revolution, I'll just briefly mm -hmm. make a quote from uh, Michel Torio, who talks about mm -hmm. the revolution and um, this idea, uh, which I mentioned before, about the unthinkable, which I think is maybe also worth uh, making relevant to this. Um, 
In his book, Silencing the Past, he writes, most often someone else has already entered the scene and set the cycle of silences. And I think that has everything to do with, you know, what's in the archive, as maybe tautological as that is. So it's not about undoing it, but always complicated, complexifying it, work, working with it, working without it, adding to it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Not making it this one monolithic form. Do we have time for, oh, we have time for, we have five, we have five more minutes. Mm -hmm. So more questions, please. Hi, thank you so much for sharing. Um, my question is about your own, um, the shift in experience as your work has evolved, as far as I understand, towards integrating indeed these complementary forms of transmission. Indeed, what you just said, that there is, um, I think, which is something, if I may say so, um, a collective quest for indeed finding um, a balance between these complementary forms of relating, understanding, sense-making, and also holding space for the ambiguity of moving from one paradigm of truth-making into a paradigm of not knowing, but knowing through different modalities, um, or not knowing through different modalities, actually, and acknowledging that. So... How has your experience as an artist, as a human, as a researcher shifted over time as you have been busy with this? Um, yeah, I, I tried to kind of include it a little bit that um, also that I realized my interaction with Leila, who's here. If you have any questions for Leila also, please. Um, um, that I realized, with Leila, but also talking to Kamile, I realized what I'm saying, or what I remember, not that what I remember, but what I found out in the archive, there were all these, like, I knew so much about what happened from those documents. But then the moment I bring it to her, she remembered it completely differently. So I realized, like, I was kind of, my knowledge um, through these documents kind of started dictating the research, and she started kind of doubting about remembering or what they what she remembered etc so that there was this like power issue that i noticed and that was the moment that i was like okay uh, something has to change and what is going wrong in that relationship and then i that's how the research kind of shifted um i tried to put it a little bit in the in the presentation i'm not sure if it's really uh, communicated but it was really realizing my role as a researcher like as a researcher you criticize the institution but then you realize your own power in relation to people um, who, who have been subjects of this uh, moment and and also in my earlier work it also speaks to that as well um, um, you know working with communities and and um, yeah, thinking about like how to bring their um, footage, their um, the material with th their own images or their surroundings to art spaces, and how you need to negotiate that that translation, and how you could do that, and what does that that also it is another moment that you need to um, think about the power imbalance and untranslatability of certain spaces to certain communities. And sometimes you might decide not to do things at all, right? Like so, but to be able to have that maneuver or to be able to have that um, ability to move backwards, I ha like I had to really disengage with, because it was a long research and I had, of course, you know, I did this research and I was like, I had this um, relation to it, it and I had to really back, um, uh, step back and kind of have some distance to it so that it does not kind of become this thing that I lead uh, um, with that that keeps that power uh, in balance. Um, so that's how it came out, how uh, other modalities um, um, came out. Yeah. Thank you. Is there one last or are we were cut off? <laughs> 
All right. <laughs> um, thanks so much to Amanda and the whole crew for creating this space. Amazing. And thank, thank you to you. Belit, to Imani. Thank you.